I can't believe it. We are already at the end of the book of Genesis. In the seventh cycle of the Parsha podcast, the weeks are just flying by. When I was a kid, every week was interminable. It's only Monday night. Oh no, I got to suffer through these classes and school. Another four or five days. It's really tough to be a kid, especially a uh, rumbunctious, mischievous, and precocious one. But now we're adults, and we have the Parsha podcast, and we have the tremendous privilege of studying Torah together each week. And it's such a delight, and it's such a joy, and we're so fortunate. And the weeks, they just fly by. We just started the seventh cycle, and now we are already at the end of of the book of Genesis, How lucky are we? How fortunate are we? We're studying together. Yes, there may be some geographic distance between you and me. I'm in the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. I'm with my trusty microphone in my trusty studio. And where are you? I don't know. You're in your car. You're on your commute. You're on the train. You're doing exercise. You're preparing for Shabbos. You're relaxing next to the cackling fire. My favorite are those who tell me that they play the podcast as they're falling asleep. I like it because it means that they listen to the whole podcast. But also, when they're going to sleep, their guards are down a little bit. And I'm able to persuade them and brainwash them when they are at a weakened state. That's just a joke. I just like it because it gets me the extra downloads. But regardless, we're together and we're close at heart and we're studying together. This is the Parsha podcast for Parshas Vayechi. The word Vayechi, of course, means, and he lived. And ostensibly, the Parsha should be about the life of Jacob. And the whole Parsha talks about his passing It begins, he's really old, and he secures a promise from Joseph that Joseph will not bury him in Egypt. Instead, Jacob will be brought to Canaan and will be interred in the cave of the patriarchs. Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, Jacob elevates them. They are like Reuben and Shimon. They are on the level of tribes on their own. And then he blesses Ephraim and Manasseh with the iconic crisscrossing of his hands. And then chapter 49, it's one of the most poetic and richly layered portions in the Torah. Jacob gathers his sons, and he's going to reveal to them what's going to happen to them in the end of days. And he gives them each a blessing, like Moshe does later on at the end of the Torah, Jacob, before he passes, he blesses the tribes, the individuals in this instance, the 12 sons of Jacob. Moshe blesses the 12 tribes once those 12 individuals have burgeoned into very numerous tribes. And he goes through each one of the sons, one by one, each verse has multiple, often disparate meanings, and the commentaries work prodigiously to decipher the subtle and nuanced messages of Jacob's blessing. And after he concludes his blessings, he dies, and he is mourned, and he is embalmed. And Joseph goes to Pharaoh and secures permission to bury Jacob in Canaan. And we read about Jacob's funeral cavalcade traveling to Canaan and the extended seven-day eulogy that he was given. And the Parsha and the book end with the aftermath of Jacob's death. The brothers are worried. Maybe now that Jacob is no longer with them, Joseph will exact his revenge. And he calms them down and he reassures them and he promises to sustain them. And then we have finally the last item in the parasha and, in fact, in the book, the death of Joseph and his prophecy foretelling the ultimate redemption from Egypt. 
So it's an interesting curiosity. The Parsha is called Vayechi, and he lived, and essentially the whole Parsha is about his passing. But I want to focus on the main subject, the central component of the Parsha, the blessings that Jacob dispenses to his boys before he passes. It's very interesting and very instructive, as we shall see. Now, this is a subject that we've spoken about in the past. Please, God, we will speak about it again in the future. We hope to advance the subject a bit further today. It's a very big subject. It's a very important subject. We cannot give it sufficient treatment in only one podcast. It's just too big, but it will fit in nicely with some of the other times that we've spoken about it, and I think it will help reinforce and broaden this very critical subject for us. So chapter 49, the penultimate chapter of the book of Genesis, Sefer Beratius, Jacob gathers his sons. Hey, Asfu, gather and I shall tell you what will happen to y'all, to you, in the end of days. Rashi tells us that Jacob wanted to reveal the end. What's going to be at the end? And we don't know what he's referring to because Jacob's prophecy conked out on him. God did not want Jacob to reveal to his sons what he had intended to reveal to them. And instead, Jacob switched his message and started saying other things. He was going to reveal to them what's going to happen at the end of the days in the Messianic era. That message, of course, relied on prophecy. And then all his sons assemble. And then he blacks out. He doesn't have that shechina resting upon him. He doesn't have the divine presence resting upon him. And he's no longer able to convey what he had planned to say. And in Rashi's words, he began saying other things. Well, what does he say? He blesses his sons in a very elaborate and nuanced fashion, starting with Reuben. And if you read these blessings, certainly the first three sons, it does not sound like a blessing at all. What does he tell Reuven? Reuven, Bechoriata, you are my firstborn. Kochi, voracious owner, you are my strength and my initial vigor. What does Rashi say? This is an unforgettable Rashi. Rashi says, what does it mean that Reuven, Reuben was Jacob's strength and initial vigor? Reuben was conceived from the first seminal emission of Jacob's life. No Seminal emission preceded that. And then he tells Reuben, Yeser se'es v'yeser az. You were destined for great offices. You were supposed to be, after all, you're the firstborn. You were supposed to be the monarch and the priest. But alas, you lost it. Pachas kamayim al tosar. You are rushing like water, and therefore you won't be foremost. Because you rearranged the beds, you interfered with Jacob's intimate life. You defiled the sacrosanct, and therefore you lost what was destined to be yours. Now, if you were to tell someone, hey, dad's going to give you a blessing. Oh, what's the blessing? What am I going to get? You're going to get a demotion, a double demotion. You were supposed to be the king. You were supposed to be the priest. Now you're a simpleton. You're a layperson. You're a plebeian. How is this a blessing? This is a question that we always wonder whenever we read these verses. Now, at the end of the whole string of blessings, the Torah recaps them and says, these are the 12 tribes, the 12 sons of Jacob. Vayvarach Osam and Jacob blessed them. They were all blessed. To us, this sounds like the opposite of a blessing. It sounds like a stern rebuke. It sounds like it's punishment. He's reprimanding Reuben. You were speedy. You were impetuous. You were running like water. And therefore, I'm going to punish you. You were supposed to be teen. You were supposed to be the priest. But now you are none of those. It's a demotion. 
This hardly constitutes a blessing in our eyes. Yet, Scripture attests that Jacob blessed all of his sons. I'll give you a blessing. All those hassles of being the king and having that red carpet rolled out before you and all the accoutrements of power and being the priest and being the intermediator between Jewish people and God when they want to bring sacrifices, being the clergyman of the nation. Ah, Don't worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. It sounds like a curse, not a blessing. That's Reuben. And then comes Shimon and Levi. And they are lumped together. Shimon and Levi, Achim. Shimon and Levi, you are brothers. But your tools, your implements are stolen, stolen craft. In their council, my soul shall not be in their congregation. My honor shall not join. For in their wrath, they killed a man. And with their will, they hamstrung an ox. Cursed is their anger. Cursed is their rage. I'm going to scatter them amongst Israel. I'm going to divide them amongst Jacob. Again, you read this simply, even if you don't look at the commentary, it sounds very harsh. And then Rashi says, what Jacob was actually conveying to his children. Shimon and Levi, you are brothers. You are the ones, the two brothers, who conspired to sell Joseph. The verse says that one of the brothers said to the other brother, let's find out what's going to be with this dreamer. Let's kill him. And we'll throw his body into one of the pits. Who were those brothers? Jacob knew. The two brothers, Shimon and Levi. It can't be Reuben, it can't be Judah, because they both tried to save Joseph. It can't be Yisachar and Zavulam because they would never speak before their older brothers. It can't be the four other candidates, the four sons of the maidservants, because after all, their hatred for Joseph was not complete because Joseph would stand up for them. It's got to be Shimon and Levi. These are the two dangerous brothers. These are the architects of the crime against Joseph. And their craft is stolen. They stole it from Esau. And therefore, Jacob tells them, I want no part of the future crimes that your descendants will commit. Not the crime of Korach's rebellion, not the crime of Zimri and his sin with the Midianite princess. When you attribute those people from the tribes of Shimon and Levi, respectively, do not attribute them all the way back to me. For in their wrath, they killed a man. They killed Shem. In the episode of the abduction of Dina, Shimon and Levi, they do the ruse, everyone circumcised and will intermarry. And when they are hurting and they are weak and vulnerable, they came and they slew Everyone in the city, they killed a man. Rashi explains, eh, it's like one man. And with their will, they hamstrung an ox. They went after Joseph. Joseph is compared to an ox. When Moshe blesses the nation, he refers to Joseph as an ox. Shimon Levi, there's some danger here. There's rage and there's brotherhood and you've gone after Shem and you tried to destroy Joseph, the ox. And like Reuben, who lost the kingdom and the priesthood, Shimon and Levi are also punished to a certain extent. I'm going to scatter them. I'm going to disperse them. I'm not going to have these two tribes gather together and allow their rage to fester and to explode. Shimon, you are going to be scattered. You're going to be itinerant. You're going to be wandering. Your descendants will be poor people who have to go beg for food. Scribes who need to peddle their wares. And school teachers who need to travel to every city. 
and you'll be scattered. Oh, and Levi, you won't even have a portion in the land. You'll have cities that are peppered throughout the land, and you'll also be supported by the tithes of all the nation's farmers. And if you got to be by every, every farm and every threshing room, you have to be there to collect your tithes. Your tithes, you're not going to be gathered together. These two are a dangerous mix. When they get together, it's, it's a tinderbox. I will separate them and they won't be such disastrous conflagrations of rage and the deployment of the weapons of Asaph. So again, we have something that we're told is a blessing, and it sounds like a stinging reproachment and a demotion, yet somehow it's classified as a blessing. Now, next comes Judah, and Rashi tells us that Judah tried to slink away. He's like, oh no, what's going to be if Jacob reprimanded Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, and now it's my turn. He's going to tell me all about what happened with the episode of, of Tamar, my daughter-in-law. And Jacob says, Judah, actually, no. You're going to be praised by your brothers. And in fact, the opposite happened. Instead of criticizing Judah for the episode of his daughter-in-law, he was praised for that story. You admitted your guilt. You could have denied that you were the party that had impregnated Tamar. And you weren't afraid. That is the quality of a monarch, of a king. You are going to be elevated to the post previously held by Ruvain. You're going to be the family of kings, King David, Messiah, all legitimate kings after David will be from the tribe of Judah. Now, this sounds like a blessing, yet somehow it is lumped together with the quote-unquote blessings of Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi. So how do we understand the central subject of our Parsha, Jacob's blessings to his sons? So there's an iconic essay. It's really back-to-back, two back-to-back essays written by Rabbi Rucham on this subject. And my grandfather, of blessed memory, he adapted and really broadened this principal idea of Rabbi Rucham. Last night, I had the great fortune of reading this essay. I've seen it before, but I got to read it. And it's it's just an absolute master class in guiding us to how to develop ourselves and how to pursue perfection. And as we know, we're here to become diamonds. We're here to refine ourselves. The Torah is The purpose of the Torah is to instruct us. Instruct us for what? To really refine ourselves and elevate ourselves and upgrade ourselves and perfect ourselves and to become more more of a noble person, more of a righteous person, more of a holy person, more of a person that's living for the reasons that the Almighty created you for. How do you do that? Where do we start? How do I figure out what I need to do? Those are the questions that everyone who's serious about this asks. How do you perfect yourself? How do you fix all your flaws? The human condition is that we're all we're all created with flaws and we all are different. And it's such a mystery. It's such a riddle. It's an enigma. And we're trying to crack the code and it's just a mystery. In this series of essays... Rabbi Rucham talks about an entire system. He builds, based upon these blessings, an entire system for understanding how this all works. And he says just absolutely incredible things, and we're not going to do it justice, because it's a real exquisite piece. It's section one of Das Chachma Musar, which is the name of the book of his essays, essay 103 and 104. Unfortunately, it's in Hebrew, so that not not everyone here can read Hebrew fluently. But if you can, I would highly recommend that you read these essays. The principal points that he says are as follows. First point he says, Every single person is endowed naturally 
with one aspect of their character. So if we look at a human as like a, like a bundle, a bundle of all sorts of things. We have, we have character, we have inclination, we have traits, we have things that we prefer and things that we don't like and things that draw us. Everyone's different in a, in a whole host of ways. There's one part of this bundle that's absolutely perfect. In his words, it's, you're like Moshe. You're, you, you're, Moshe is the perfect in all aspects of his bundle. Every one of us, we start off our life here and we have one quality, one element, one aspect of ourselves that's completely, completely perfect. Totally unblemished, unflawed, uncorrupted, pristine. In that area, we're like Moshe. And when we see someone who has a flaw in that area, it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that. Because to us, in that area, each one of us, in our area that we are perfect, we cannot fathom someone not being perfect in that We've never seen anything like that. He gives an example. Someone who's very calm, never gets angry. That, that's a wonderful quality. <laughs> if you're perfect in that, that means that in one of the most important sticks in your bundle, you're perfect. Someone like that, they see other people getting angry and screaming and wrath and rage and throwing stuff and it doesn't make any sense. They, they, they're looking at an alien Humans don't do that. And the reason why it's so unfathomable to them is because in that one area, they're like Moshe. Each one of us, point number one, is endowed with a quality naturally that's totally perfect. That supreme prime quality, that is your ticket to achieve perfection. The way you achieve perfection in every area of your life, in every stick in your bundle, it's by protecting said prime quality. If you defend the territory, so to speak, if you protect that quality at all costs, eventually that will lead to every other stick in your bundle being refined and elevated and perfected and fixed as well. Because there's natural overlap between different aspects of our life, if we keep this one kind of North Star, this one stick that's the perfect part of our essence, if we maintain that and we don't allow it to ever become corrupted, that will flow over, that will cascade over to every other spillover, that will spill over to every other area of our life, and eventually we will achieve total perfection in every stick in our bundle. And thus, our objective is really, it's really defensive. Protect that one quality that you have that's perfect. Protect it at all costs. Don't allow it to get eroded. And through that, you'll achieve total perfection. If you defend those qualities, it will spill over to every other area of life and you will ultimately perfect every part of your being. We all have an ace up our sleeves. We have a quality of the the thousands of possible traits and aspects and elements and qualities, the sticks in our bundle. One part of it, it's completely perfect, at least initially. And our life mission is to identify what that is and to protect it at all costs. And he tells us that the tests that a person is given, the challenges that are thrown our way, are going to be targeted at that quality that is our best quality. Specifically in the area that you're strongest in, that's where you're tested. And there's a certain... Interesting paradox over here. People may feel, well, this area I'm, I'm, I'm constantly struggling in. I'm getting tested in this area again and again. It must be an area of vulnerability. But the truth is, 
the area that you're tested in is precisely the area that you have the most ability in. And if you defend that, you protect that, you're actually reinforcing that quality that you have naturally. And through that, you're able to achieve your perfection. But what happens if someone, God forbid, loses those battles? Then their prime quality, their one mosaic quality, can erode. And then you could lose your ticket to perfection because you could lose your ability to achieve total perfection because now you don't have that one quality that towers above all that will spill over to all. Now you're at risk of not being able to achieve your perfection. But if we defend that prime quality and we never allow it to get compromised, eventually that will serve as the catalyst to elevate every other aspect of ourselves until we become completely perfect. Now he connects it to the parsha when he talks about all the qualities that are featured in Jacob's blessings. Those are the mosaic prime qualities of each of the sons. And the blessings that they get are all fitting to what they really had initially. Those qualities that you have naturally are really your greatest qualities because you had to work really hard to defend them. And thus Judah, the example that he gives, Judah, he, he was born a king. He was born a leader. When he opened up his mouth, everyone listened. How was he tested? He was tested in the episode of, of Tamar, and he was forced to admit that he was wrong. He was specifically tested in the area of leadership. And when he withstood that test, he reinforced what he always had. He earned, so to speak, for eternity, what he always had within him. Joseph. Joseph is the, the holy one amongst his brothers, the distinct one amongst his brothers. How was he tested? He was tested in matters of holiness. And when he withstood said tests, again, he reinforced what he always had naturally. And he earned for eternity what he had naturally. And that was cemented in the blessings of Jacob. That's a short synopsis of, of this idea, courtesy of Rabbi Rucham. And my grandfather, of blessed memory, he extended this principle a bit further. He said that just as there is a singular, perfect, positive quality, that one mosaic stick in your bundle, unless it gets corrupted, it's just perfect. We also all have a flaw, a shortcoming that is completely corrupted. Just as we start off with one part of us that's just perfect, 100%, 10 out of 10, 1,000 out of 1,000, we start off with one negative aspect of our personality that's also completely corrupted. And just as when, when you execute your mission properly, just as that prime quality can be used to eventually fix everything, that prime flaw, that can be the unfortunate cause for things to go in the opposite direction. If you allow that to run amok, eventually it will result in total character and personal devastation. But you start off with a prime quality and a prime flaw that are both absolutely complete at least initially, but that can be changed. If a person does not defend the prime quality, allows those tests that are invariably going to challenge it, if he allows those tests to disrupt the perfection of the mosaic quality, well, it will erode and eventually it will be lost. On the other hand, if a person does not allow the bad quality to fester, curves its power, limits it, Make sure that it does not surface. Slowly, the bad will be reformed, will be repaired, will be refined, will be reduced, and eventually fixed. 
So there's an entire system here of character development and character perfection. And of course, the flip side, the risks of total character erosion and degeneration. But using this as a backdrop, we now realize that it's really important for us to identify what are the elements of our life that are assets, that are qualities, and what are the dangers, what are the flaws, the shortcomings that can spell our undoing. You really need to know what you're composed of. What are the sticks in your bundle? Only once you know what the qualities and the flaws are, only then you have a a picture of what you're composed of, what do I need to defend and what do I need to be wary of? What are the main threats? Only then could you really design your life to perfection. But how, in fact, do you know? How do you know what a, well, what those prime qualities are and the prime flaws are? If you don't know, if you're ignorant to that question, well, then your life mission is in peril. If you don't know what tools you're trying to use or you need to use, well, then you're severely disadvantaged in any attempt to achieve perfection. If you don't know your qualities, you're in trouble. If you don't know your flaws, you're in trouble. And therefore, the more we can discover about ourselves, the better we are, the better off we are at trying to figure out how to live our life. My grandfather, blessed memory, said, this is the blessing of Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi. To discover your flaws, to discover what the arch flaw that you have is, it's one of the best blessings that someone can receive. Someone who knows that, they have critical, indispensable, invaluable knowledge to know what they need to do in their lives. Jacob, in his blessing, was informing them what their primary flaw is. He tells Ruvain, I'm going to give you a blessing. Ruvain, you are impulsive. You are impetuous. You are someone who who behaves like running water. You, You do things before you think them through before you actually play out what the consequences of your behavior is. And that leads to bad decisions. And that is what happened when you interfered with my sleeping arrangements, says Jacob. There's a quality that you have, and you've had it since you were little. This is the problem that you were sent here to fix. Now you know. Shimon and Levi, you too have a flaw that your brothers and you have zeal in protecting the brotherhood, the family against any would-be encroachment. And you have that mixed with the craft of Asav, mixed with violence. Step one, blessing one, is Jacob's revealing to his children that information that we all wish we knew. We all wish we knew exactly, clearly, in a defined fashion. What is it that is holding you back? What is it that you need to overcome? What are those threats, those dangers they need to avoid? Blessing number one is Jacob spells it out clearly to Ruvain, Shimon, Levi. But he doesn't stop there. Step two, blessing number two. He tells them how to live life. He positions them to be able to avoid constantly butting their heads into this flaw. He designed their life in a way that they can live notwithstanding this terrible flaw that they have. You have a flaw. I hate to say it. Even 
even you, we all have flaws. Only God is perfect. Only angels are flawless. Even Moshe. Moshe, as we like to remember, is the most criticized person in the whole Torah, even though he's the most perfect one. He was the most criticized because we're trying to remember even Moshe. Even Moshe, the greatest human to ever live. Even Moshe wasn't perfect. We're not perfect. That's that's why it's interesting. That's why it's fun. That's why life matters. That's why life is meaningful. We all have flaws. And the great game, the great mission is to figure out how we can overcome them. And one of the ways we can do that is to design a life where that doesn't matter. That's negated. That becomes a non-factor. If you could render the weakness into a non-factor, you're not going to be blundering at every turn. One of the best strategies, and this is, of course, only once you have the first blessing, once you know what your strengths are, once you know what your weaknesses are, the strategy is to design the system in which you're going to operate Design it in a way that the strengths are going to be given opportunities to shine. Design a system where those strengths are going to be featured, they're going to be surfaced, and the weaknesses, they're going to be relegated to being unimportant. It's like handwriting. If you're like me and you just don't have great handwriting, you're in luck because it doesn't really matter so much in today's world. Everyone's typing. Handwritten notes are almost anachronistic. Like it's good. You want to position yourself in a world where that your flaw doesn't really matter. That's, of course, a silly example. But in every area, in every conflict, in every system that you're going to operate in, the best way to design the system is to figure out what your strengths are and to Make the system one that demands those qualities and one that avoids your weaknesses. You know, you, you think of a battlefield. You want to choose the kind of battlefield that most neutralizes your weaknesses and most accentuates the value of your strengths. Even in business, you think about you know how to deal with the competition, you know, what are our strengths, what are our core competencies. I try to figure out how to make the area that the value is accrued to, the choke point of value, should be in the things that you're good at. Chess. We play a lot of chess here. Not not as much as uh, we used to, (laughs) thank God. But if you have a certain style of game that you like to play in, a positional game, a very tactical game, you want to set up the board in a way that your advantages are going to be manifested. That's what Jacob's doing for his children. There's a pattern here. First, he diagnoses their flaws. And then he gives them what looks like to us as punishment. But truthfully, it's a double blessing. Reuven, you're you're impulsive. You're impetuous. You're speedy like water. You're quick to act. You're insufficiently deliberative. You're not contemplative enough. You're not circumspect. If you were in a highly pressurized environment, such a flaw would be deadly. If you're a king or a priest that's not cool-headed, well, that could spell national and personal disaster. Being impetuous and impulsive as a priest, well, that's another disaster waiting to happen. So there's a double blessing here. A, what are your superpowers and what are your super flaws? And once you know what they are, figure out how you could design a life, design a playing field in such a way that the superpowers are going to be most important and the flaws are not going to play a big role. Reuben thus got a double blessing. Shimon and Levi, the same thing. Their flaw is 
unrestrained brotherhood. You, when you feel like your sister is taken, you behave in, in ways that are like Asaph. You kill a man, really a, a whole town, for violating your sister. And Joseph, he's coming to cause problems in the family? You're going to hamstring this ox for threatening your sense of brotherhood. Again, that's the diagnosis. And what's the solution? I'll scatter you. I'll disperse you. Shimon in your way. Paupers, scribes, school teachers. Levi, Levi, in your way. No ancestral lands. Just scattered cities throughout the territory. You'll be a recipient of tithes. And you have to go to all the thresholds to get your sustenance. And when you're scattered and you're not united then the risk of this tinderbox of brotherhood is mitigated. So Jacob has a whole master plan here. He's revealing the flaws. He's revealing what are the potential threats that you need to avoid. And there's the life design component of it as well. How can you flourish notwithstanding said flaw? Once you know your shortcomings, it's actually a wonderful blessing because now you have your marching orders. And I remember that we talked about this a few months ago, Parsha's Beratius. The first Parsha in the book of Genesis, in an episode titled Cain's Discovery, we spoke about how Cain was given really important and valuable and actionable information and he didn't realize it. It sounds bad when you discover it. But once you put it in context and you realize how important it is, it is, in fact, a great blessing. I want to take this whole subject a step further. Reuben, his flaw was that he would act before he thought things through. He's impulsive. He's running like water. How does the blessing start? There's a little preamble. Reuven, Bechoriata, Reuven, you are my firstborn. Kochi, my strength. Voracious Oni. And the first of my vigor. So Rashi says it's referring to the first drop that produced Reuven. I saw for the first time an incredible Midrash. The Midrash connects this story, this blessing to Ruvain, to one of Ruvain's descendants. Namely, a gentleman by the name of On Ben Pelas. You may recall, in the book of Numbers, in Parshas Korach, there is... A rebellion. Korach is Moshe's first cousin, and he launches a rebellion against Moshe and Aaron. And he has with him a motley crew, 250 unnamed leaders of the people, plus Dasan and Aviram, Dathan and Abiram, and a gentleman by the name of On Ben Pelas. And they question Moshe's superiority. Are you better than us? The entire congregation is holy. Why do you elevate yourself above everyone else? It doesn't end up well for Korach and his co-conspirators, and I apologize for spoiling the story for you. Some of them are swallowed by a sinkhole, some of them are consumed by a divine fire, and some of them die in a plague. Of all these mutineers, only On Ben Pelas survives. How does he survive? So the Talmud tells us that his wife saved him. Moshe and Aaron, these are the leaders. Comes along Korach and says, no, you're not legitimate. I'm really the leader, not you. And he gets everyone to join his rebellion. And own Ben Pelas, his wife, she tells him, what difference do you have? Why, why are you getting involved in this conflict. If Moshe's the king, well, then you're nobody. You're an ordinary individual. And if Korach is the king, well, then you're also an ordinary individual. 
What do you have to gain? Don't get involved. But he says, well, I I promise to get involved. She says, I'll solve it for you. Everyone is holy. Let's see. Let's use their holiness as a defense mechanism. She gives him some wine. He gets drunk. He goes to sleep. She sits in the antechamber of the tent and she removes her hair covering. Everyone's trying to get Owen to join the rebellion. And they walk into the first part of the tent and they they see her without her hair being covered. They say, oh, no, she's not being modest. We're not going in. And by the time Owen wakes up from his drunkenness induced his wine induced slumber all the co-conspirators are dead and that's it he survived now his name is own and jacob starts his blessing to ruvain the ancestor of own by saying racious oni it's the same root the first of my vigor oni Says the Midrash, this is a prophecy foretelling the story of On. On is the descendant of Ruvain. And it says, Racious Oni, the word racious means the first, but that word is used in several places in the Torah. Of course, the first word in the Torah is biracious in the beginning. But the word racious is used by several other mitzvos, including the mitzvah of Chala, when you're supposed to take racious arisosechim, the, the first part of your dough, and you're supposed to separate it from the larger part of the dough. And before you use the dough to make bread, you take that part and you designate it to the Kohen. Racious Oni, says the Midrash, Jacob is foretelling of own. And how he got saved by his wife in a way similar to Chala. Just like Chala, you separate a smaller part of the dough from the larger part of the dough. So too his wife separated him from the rest of the co-conspirators. This is just an incredible midrash. There's some sort of connection between Reuben and and his descendant, Own, And somehow over here, when Jacob is about to give the blessing to Ruvain, somehow it's noteworthy, it's important, it's pertinent, it's germane to tell us about his future descendant, Own ben Pelas. Now, in general, in the whole story of Own ben Pelas, his wife tells him, well, why are you joining the rebellion against Moshe and Aaron? If Moshe and Aaron, well, they're the leaders, you're nothing. And if Korach, he's the leader, you're still nothing. Why are you getting involved? And there's an obvious question. His wife told him something so supremely logical. What, in fact, was Own Ben Pelas originally thinking to join the rebellion? She says, well, you have nothing to gain. Well, if you had nothing to, to gain, then why did he initially, why was he initially motivated to join the rebellion? I think we, we see the answer here in this Midrash. Own is a descendant of Ruvain. Ruvain's flaw is that he's impetuous, he's impulsive, he acts before he thinks. What was own thinking? What was his calculus to join the rebellion? He wasn't thinking. He's a descendant of Ruvain. He's impetuous and impulsive like Ruvain. He's running like water, not stopping to think for a second before he acts. The water doesn't deliberate. Oh, should we go down the hill or not? I don't know. What do you think? It just goes. And his wife saved him. How? Like Chala, Rashis Ariso Sechem. Chala, it's a really interesting mitzvah. You're, you're ready to bake. You have a whole dough. It's been a long process to turn the initial seeds into the stalks of wheat, and you've now had flour and you mixed it, and you have dough. And the oven's hot. And you're hungry. Before you bake something, 
You have to separate part of it and say, this, I'm not baiting. This is the same pattern as what's happening with own. He wants to do stuff. He wants to bait stuff, so to speak. And his wife slows him down and says, like Chala, she's going to separate before you bait something. Before you actualize your ideas, you have to maybe consider that you have to separate part of it. What part should be baked and what part should not be baked. It's interesting that this mitzvah is one of the mitzvahs that are the domain of the women. Perhaps men tend to have a tendency to be more own-like, more Reuben-like, to act maybe without without thinking sufficiently. Maybe this is why Chala is a woman's mitzvah and part of her role to bring about better judgment to separate the bakeable from the non-bakeable. But I found this to be very interesting that in the episode of Ruvain and when Jacob lines up, so to speak, the flaw that he has and the flaw that he's going to perpetuate to his children because we see that the descendants of these 12 individuals are going to harbor the qualities of their forbearer. And we see in a very similar way, in a similar way to what Jacob tried to do for Ruvain, Owen's wife did for him. And if we look at Shimon and Levi, we find something similar. Shimon and Levi, they're brothers, and they maybe are using some of the modus operandi of, of Esav, and they are uprooting or hamstrunging, hamstringing, hamstrung an ox. But if you study their, their stories, you'll find something really interesting. There's, there's a divergence between the path that Shimon takes versus the path that Levi takes. Levi becomes the most elevated of the tribes. The clergy, the Levites and the Kohanim from the tribe of Levi. Moshe and Aaron from the tribe of Levi. The most noble and holy of the tribes is Levi. Even in Egypt, the tribe was not enslaved. They never ceased to circumcise, even in the wilderness when it was considered dangerous to circumcise. Levi always did. When the Jewish people did the golden calf, Moshe issues a call to arms, Mila Shemelai, who's going to come join me in eradicating this menace? And all the Levites came and they slew all the perpetrators. So we see a problematic, to a certain extent, son of Jacob. And he somehow catapults and ascends to becoming the greatest of the tribes. By contrast, Shimon ends up being the lowest of the tribes. And the episode of Zimri, as uh, mentioned in Rashi, the leader of the tribe of Shimon, he comes to Moshe with the Midianite princess. Is this woman permitted or is she prohibited? She's prohibited. Well, who permitted for you to take the daughter of Jethro? And then in a very public fashion begins to sin with this woman. And then Pinchas from the tribe of Levi he comes in and he smuggles in a peg and we remember the story. It's quite memorable. And he skewers them. And the whole tribe of Shimon is really in on this. And they were all punished for it. And when Moshe blesses the nation at the end of the Torah, there's one tribe he doesn't mention. And it's the tribe of Shimon. And it's an interesting divergence. These two brothers... When Jacob assesses them at the end of his life, they are the same. They have the same diagnosis. And Jacob gives the same prescription to solve said diagnosis. Yet they end up in such divergent places. And it's not just that they end up in different places. Levi becomes the best and Shimon becomes 
the worst. So I want to add another component to this whole subject. And like I promised or warned, it is a very big subject and we're only talking about one element of it. Previously, we've talked about, you know, two points about this, the idea of figuring out your qualities and your flaws, identifying what those prime qualities are, the prime flaws, the diagnosis, and then the importance of avoiding your flaws. What do you do when you have a flaw? Well, design your life so it doesn't become an issue. That's one way to deal with this problem. There's another way to deal with it. We would call this to lean in. That's when you take that flaw and you find a way to target it, to redirect it, to channel it towards a very positive end. Using your flaw or your erstwhile flaw, finding a positive usage of it. Taking that flaw, that erstwhile flaw, and transforming it into a quality. When Jacob talks about Shimon and Levi, he says, Bertsonum ikrushar. With their will, they hamstrung an ox. Well, what's this ox? Rashi tells us, well, Joseph, he is compared to an ox. And who tried to kill Joseph? These two brothers. Part of the flaw of Shimon and Levi is what we call here, they were antioxidants. They're opposed to Joseph. There's something about Joseph that really wrinkles them. They're anti-Joseph. They're anti-ox. I saw a really interesting comment in the Sefer HaRamazim. There's another ox. There's another ox. There's another bovine. Levi found a productive outlet to their quality of being antioxidant. The Jewish people made a golden calf. A calf is a baby ox. Who came to go defend the honor of God and go kill all the perpetrators after Moshe issues the call to arms? Mila Shem who is going to come join me in this battle to defend God's honor? The entire tribe of Levi coalesced. And what did Moshe do with this little baby ox? He ground it to powder. Who destroyed the golden calf? The only tribe that did that is the tribe that we're told here many centuries prior. They have a quality of Ikrushar. They could destroy an ox. And that was really referring to Joseph. But our sages tell us that they found a different way to deploy their antioxidants. And that is how Levi became the greatest of the tribes. Via that same quality that could have spelled their destruction, they were anti-oxen. In one setting, it was disastrous, but they found a productive, a constructive way to deploy it for good. Now, a quick side point. This is pointed out by my friend, Rabbi Elchanan Shaf. These two oxen, Joseph and the golden calf, they seem to be totally unrelated. Joseph is compared, like many of the tribes, to animals, and Benjamin is a wolf, and Dan is a snake, and uh, Yisachar is a donkey, and uh, Judah is a lion. Okay, so Joseph is an ox. Oh, and the golden calf is a baby ox. They seem to be totally unrelated. But how did they make the golden calf? Do you remember how they made the golden calf? A couple of days before the Exodus, Moshe was looking for the bones of Joseph. You can't leave without the bones of Joseph. 
And where were they? They're hidden. And Moshe takes a little plate and writes in it, Ale Shar, arise, O ox. And he throws it into the Nile. And the bones of Joseph surface. And some enterprising member of the Erev Rav, of the mixed multitude, ran into the Nile and snatched that little plate. And then when Aaron issues the call to everyone give their gold, we're going to make the festival for God tomorrow, he throws all the gold into the fire. And that member of the mixed multitude takes that same plate that Moshe wrote on it, Alei Shar, Arise, O Ox, and throws it into the fire. And what comes out? A little baby ox, a golden calf. So what this means, I don't know. But there's some connection between Ox 1 and Ox 2, Joseph, and the golden calf. And Levi starts off his tenure as an antioxidant against Joseph. But then he somehow matures into the best version of this. And he destroys the other ox. He's still an antioxidant, but he destroys it. This time it's not the ox of of Joseph. It's the golden calf. Now, if we follow this through line, we see that Korach, he's also from the tribe of Levi, and he's also an antioxidant. What does he tell Moshe and Aaron when he launches his rebellion? It's almost identical to what the brothers tell Joseph. After Joseph has his dreams of grandeur, they say to him, are you going to rule us? Are you going to dominate us? You're no better than us. What does Korach tell Moshe? The entire creation is all holy. And why are you going to rule over us? Why are you going to lord over us? Korach used his antioxidant for a destructive force. And Jacob says, I don't want to be attributed to him. But the rest of the tribe, they found a productive use for this quality. And that not only mitigated any harm that could come from it, it actually catapulted them to the highest of heights. Levi channeled their hatred for the ox to the good kind of hatred of an ox, to hatred of the golden calf, and thereby became the most elevated of tribes. Shimon, by contrast, they also remained antioxidants. And Rashi tells us that in the episode of Zimri, when they went up against Moshe, and they were skewered by Pinchas. And after that happened, the whole tribe was belittling Pinchas. And the Talmud spends a lot of time telling us, this is in the book of Sotan, page 43a, that Pinchas was a descendant of Joseph. And the reason why Pinchas led the war against Midian is because of what they did to his ancestor, to Joseph. And Thomas spends a lot of time telling us that Pinchas comes from Joseph. I think this is hinting to us. The tribe of Shimon, they still had some of the bad form of antioxidants. They capitulated to their bad attribute. Maybe they didn't take the message that Jacob gave them. They didn't take it to heart. And thereby they descended and became the lowest of the tribes. Now, as promised, this is a very big subject and a very important one because, you know, we're here, we're in the Parsha podcast, we're not just here to have fun. Well, we are here to have fun, of course, but we're here to learn something, to to elevate ourselves and hopefully achieve a a higher level of, of enlightenment, of refinement. And we have to realize that we're all different There can't just be a cookie-cutter, one-size-fits-all approach. Of course, the the Torah is universal for all Jews. But what about me? What about you? Each individual has their own little path that they must embark upon. And it's critical for us to understand our character. If you don't know what you're made up of, you really don't have a, a plan to achieve this in a comprehensive fashion. 
If you don't know what you're composed of, how can you design your life to perfection? And that demands that you know your qualities and you know your flaws. And discovering that is a great blessing. And Jacob gave his sons not just that blessing, he gave them a double blessing. The diagnosis of the flaw and the instructions for how to mitigate the damage that this flaw can unleash. Reuven, you're, you're the impulsive one. You won't be king. And thereby, you'll avoid having to encounter this flaw over and over. Not king, not priest. Owen Ben Pelas and his wife, they undergo the same sequence. He joins the rebellion impulsively, and she skillfully navigates him out of it like the Chala. Shimon and Levi, they're brothers, they're antioxidants. They want to hamstring an ox. And that can be manifested in, in different ways, maybe three different ways. It, it could be neutral. If they're separated and they're traveling and they're never united together and they don't congregate, they don't meet so many oxen. And that's not good, not bad. It's a way to avoid it. You, you avoid the live a life where you're never getting too close to danger. And that's what Jacob proposed to Shimon and Levi. Each one of them went in a different direction. Shimon allowed the antioxidants to really fester and to dominate them. And they seemingly were fighting Joseph and his descendants. And thereby they spiraled to the lowest nadirs, becoming the lowest of the tribes. Levi found an ingenious way to convert the liability into an asset. And this is the third way to behave when you have a flaw. Either try to avoid it, it's neutral, or capitulate to it, or turn it into an asset. He was an antioxidant, all right, but he deployed it in the best possible fashion to destroy the golden calf and thereby become the greatest of the tribes. And yes, there were vestiges of the bad antioxidants in the episode of Korach. But the tribe as a whole utilized this aspect to gain great heights. Now, for us, we have to realize that we don't have Jacob. Nevertheless, to understand our qualities and our flaws, it's absolutely indispensable. It's paramount because that's the best way to understand what our strengths are and our weaknesses are and to know where our vulnerabilities lie and where our opportunities lie. It's indispensably instructive to help us design our life. And yes, no one wants to dwell upon their flaws and their shortcomings, and we get really angry if someone tells us about it. But the truth is, that knowledge is golden. Now, what do we do now, absent Jacob or any other prophet to guide us? That's an important question, and there are some answers. But we're going to have to leave that for another time, it's already, this is clocking in as one of the longest Parsha podcasts. And we're not even up to the question that's going to raise our IQ. So uh, as they say, stay thirsty, my friends. We'll get to it, please, God. But now let's get to the, the question. It's so important for us to get a little smarter about the Parsha every week. So we have one idea. This is more than an idea, of course, but we try to like to end up with a question. Or any other idea like a quip or a quote. This is a fun question with a very nice answer. Joseph in our Parsha makes contradictory statements. After Jacob died, they bury him. And the brothers are worried that maybe now Joseph is going to lay down the hammer upon them. The Midrash tells us that on, on their way back from Canaan, I didn't know this till this week, listen to this, on the way back from Canaan, Joseph made a pit stop. Where did he stop? He stopped in the pit, a pit stop. Which pit? The pit that they threw him into, the pit teeming 
with snakes and scorpions and bereft of water. He wanted to thank God for doing a miracle for him in that location. And the brothers see that and they're, oh no, he hasn't forgotten. It's been, a, it's been a while. It's been 39 years. But he remembers, all right. And they thought that he's still seething over the mistreatment that he endured. And now he's going to exact his revenge. And the brothers appeal to him. And they say, we'll we'll be your servants. And Jacob told us to tell you this before he died. Joseph's response seems to be a bit contradictory. Chapter 50, verse 19 and verse 20. Yosef says to them, don't, don't be scared. Am I in God's place? You thought evil upon me, but God thought goodness upon me. God wanted me to be put in this position. Rashi explains something unbelievable. Am I in God's place? That's what Joseph tells his brothers. Even if I wanted to harm you, can I actually do it? Do I have the ability? If it's against the will of God, I'll, I'll bring you proof. You wanted to harm me. It was 10 against one. And what happened? I was unharmed. How did that work out for you? Joseph is telling his brothers, no one can harm another person unless that's the will of God. Even if I wanted to harm you, I can't do it. God's in total control. Even if I wanted to harm you, I can't. You know, to the untrained eye, it looks like Joseph has all the power. He controls the government and the police and the army and the defense establishment. And he has bodyguards who listen to anything he tells them to do. He's the de facto king. Joseph testifies to his brother, I am incapable of doing any harm to you. Am I in God's stead? Joseph is making a statement of total submission to God. He is in total control, and I am completely enfeebled. That's statement number one. The very next verse, verse 21, he tells him, Fa'ata al and now don't be fearful. Anochi achalkel eschem estabchem. I will sustain you and your children. I'm, I'm going to sustain you? And your children? Joseph, you just told me you have no strength, you have no power, you have no ability outside of God. Why is Joseph suddenly saying, I'm going to sustain you, I'm going to take care of you, I'm going to take care of your children? He just told us that, am I in God's stead? I can't do anything without God. How do we reconcile Joseph's apparent contradiction? So what I say just tell us something very, very wonderful. We are all required to have endless faith, complete faith in God. And we reject heresy and we reject atheism. We believe in God. However, there is a time and place for heresy, for atheism. What? What? Yeah. There is a place for atheism. Just like, perhaps we can say, just like Levi found a kosher outlet for his antioxidants. There's a time for atheism. And when's that? When someone else shows up and says, I need, I need something, I need help, I need food, I need to take care of me. If you had total faith and you always operated with total faith, you would say, well, who, you're hungry? Who made you hungry? You're sick? Who made you sick? You're lonely? Who, who made you lonely? You're suffering? Isn't that, that's all the handiwork of God. God will take care of you. Don't come to me. That is an act of perfect faith. And that's also the behavior of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, well, this is mine. What's mine is mine. Came to me from God. What's yours is yours. 
came to you from God and your plight, it's not my fault. God decided that and therefore don't come to me. Go to God. The people of Sam Gomorrah, their lack of kindness and hospitality, we're told, it comes from a twisted version of faith. Why? Because it doesn't have a little dose of atheism as well. When it comes to someone else's needs, don't say, well, God will take care of you. No. It's our responsibility. I will sustain you, says Joseph. I just said a second ago, am I in the place of God? Joseph knows everything's from God. But when it comes to someone else's needs, you don't have faith. You have to pull out some some heresy, a little dose, a little minor micro dose of atheism. Don't say, God will take care. Oh, no. Anochi, achal kel, aschem, it's my responsibility. I think if you're listening, I don't know why, I feel like the Parsha podcasts are getting a little too long. A little too long! I apologize for the length, but I appreciate, I appreciate every second that you give your attention to the Parsha podcast. It's wonderful. I'm, I'm in the torch center now. It's nice and quiet. But I feel like we're having a conversation. But let's make it bilateral. Send me an email. What's my email address? Well, rabbiwalby at gmail.com. If you can't remember that, if you look in the notes, in the description of the podcast, every podcast, it will have a little reminder of the email address. Send me an email. I currently have a lot of emails in my inbox, and I apologize, but sometimes I like to... I like to finish recording the Parsha podcast. And then I say, okay, I got to sit down for all these emails. I got some emails this week that were quite lengthy, I must say. So forgive me if I haven't responded, but I, I do get to every email. So send me an email, rabbiwalbygym.com. Have an incredible rest of your day. Have a stupendous rest of your week and a sensational, uplifting, invigorating inspiring, enjoyable Shabbos upcoming. And please don't help the Mari. We'll talk again next week.